Hello, I would like to remind you to ask question at the end of the presentation. Uh, our next presenter works as a messaging architect in the Deutsche Börse. Uh, his name is Jakob Scholz. Please invite him. Hello, everyone. Uh, this talk is uh, in the IoT stream, but I hope you won't be too disappointed that my background is actually not uh, IoT but finance. I uh, work for Deutsche Börse. That's uh, one of the world's leading uh, exchange market operators. We run several stock and uh, derivative exchanges. We have our own clearing house. We run services with in settlement and custody. And uh, in the last years, I spent the time building uh, interfaces uh, based on the AMQP protocol. And that's not only interfaces which connect our own applications, but uh, also interfaces which uh, connect us with our customers who write their own applications. I think that's uh, not that usual, and that's why I would like to share the experience we made, uh, what we learned, and then discuss it with you. Uh, before I start with the first slide, uh, let me ask you, how many of you know what uh, message-oriented middleware is? And how many of you know AMQP? Okay, that's quite a lot. A lot more than I expected, I have to say. I'm glad to see that. Uh, so let's start. In finance, the IT is not really that different from uh, the other areas. We have usually some server which uh, we run, and then we have some customers who run their own applications, which uh, are communicating with our server and uh, do some transactions, exchange information. In the past, we did it usually in the way that we had some libraries, which we provided to the customers as, uh, as the API, and the customers used them in their own applications. And the protocol between the library and the server was usually something uh, proprietary, not really well documented, not really opened. So uh, can someone see what's wrong with this approach? Uh, it's basically with the library API, you as a service provider are intruding into the space which does not belong to you. You ship some library which uh, has to be installed by your customer, so they usually don't have really free choice of operating system, they don't have free choice uh, of hardware, they often have no, ch no choice of uh, programming language or uh, choice of programming style. And uh, since it's your software running uh, with your customers, then you need to provide a lot of support. When the customer calls and says, look, the library is not working for me, you have to deal with uh, the fact which operating system is he using, which patches did he install. Uh, and that can be very complicated, especially when it's not your computers, you have no access to these computers. So lately, we are switching more towards protocol-based API. So what does change with the protocol API? The API is not anymore the library as it used to be, but the API is the protocol. And the library and the client application is full responsibility of the customer. So uh, as, I, as you can see from the picture, the separation between the service provider and the client is now much more clear. And uh, this uh, may sound on a first look like if you offload more work onto your customers, who would then have to write the library, uh, test it, support it on their own. But uh, if you choose a good protocol for the API, then maybe they don't have to do it because maybe there are many different libraries available on the market and they just take one of them, they choose the operating system, programming language, whatever they want, and they just develop it accordingly. And uh, because no software is running uh, on the customer side which you provided, that uh, frees you from a lot of the support activity because uh, it's a customer software and the customer knows the software because they wrote it and they can support it uh, themselves. Uh, 
uh, I would eventually got to get to it to, and, at the end. Uh, in reality, it's of course not that uh, there's no support activity which you have to do. So at the end, uh, it's your customers, and if you want to keep them happy, then, uh, uh, okay, sorry, to repeat the question. So the question was, uh, uh, whether it happened that the customers uh, call to us and complain that their library is buggy and complain that the protocol is wrong and not working. So this definitely ha happens. And uh, if you want to have happy customers, then you have to deal with it somehow. But it happens a lot less than uh, when we really shipped the libraries to the customers. And uh, uh, later during the slides, I will get into more details what to do so that uh, these situations don't happen uh, too often. So in the end, you have to work with your customers to find out if the problem is in the library or in your API? Right. At the end, if they reach out to you, then yes, you have to work together. It differs a lot uh, customer to customer. Uh, some customers don't call us at all. Some call us very often with, uh, let's say, uh, simple questions which they might be answer, able to answer themselves. So I mentioned that uh, with a good protocol, this uh, protocol API might not necessarily mean that we are just offloading work onto your customers. So what makes a good protocol? There are many, many different technical things which uh, you can use to define a good protocol. You can talk about performance, throughput, latency, reliability. What was important for us and what's important for the protocol APIs is the openness of the protocol. And that's why we have chosen AMQP as the protocol of our choice. AMQP has quite a lot of history. It was created as a kind of common project between IT companies and financial companies. But, uh, and that's why this talk is in the IoT stream. Today it's very valid also for the Internet of Things. Uh, there are some older versions of the protocol, in particular the 09 and 091, which uh, is basically a synonym for RabbitMQ. It has a, quite a huge community. If you search on GitHub for AMQP, I'm pretty sure most of the results will be for RabbitMQ. But it's still basically one product, one community. The same applies to the 010 version of the protocol, which is actually where we started uh, some years ago. Uh, the 010 is implemented in the Apache Cupid project, uh, eventually uh, sold as Red Hat Merge Messaging uh, by Red Hat. But again, although it has a good community, it's still just the one community. And that's what's different with the AMQP 1.0, and uh, if you start today, that's what I would recommend to you, because with AMQP 1.0, you don't have any more one community, but you have much bigger ecosystem. It's not only uh, Apache or Red Hat uh, who implements uh, AMQP 1.0, but uh, already today you have working products from Microsoft, uh, IBM, but also from some smaller companies. So you have a uh, much uh, bigger choice. And if we talk about uh, openness, it's uh, approved as ISO standard, and you probably can do uh, much better in terms of open standards than uh, having an ISO standard. But just by choosing the protocol, that doesn't really create the protocol APIs because the protocol is just mean how to do it, but it's not the API itself. So what do you need to do to specify the protocol API? You need to clarify network, security. Uh, you need to specify how to send or receive messages, and uh, many more things, including documentation and support. So let's start with the network. Uh, AMQP is usually running over TCP, so you can basically use the public uh, internet infrastructure. And uh, if you would use it for Internet of Things, then that would be probably your choice. Uh, in Deutsche Börse, we are using uh, usually VPNs and lease lines, which give us more performance, uh, security, and stability. Uh, but they can get also expensive, and they are not really suitable for everyone. 
Uh, also, if you want the API to be used directly from web browsers, uh, you should definitely consider WebSocket support. Uh, the binding between AMQP and WebSockets is slowly uh, getting more and more final in the OASIS uh, committees which are standardizing it. And uh, that allows you to write applications which talk AMQP directly in the browsers uh, using JavaScript. A bit with the network related is encryption. AMQP supports both uh, uh, TLS over AMQP as well as uh, AMQP over TLS. The second one seems to be the usual choice. So you open the normal TCP connection. On top of it, you establish the TLS channel. And only then you open the AMQP connection. Uh, I would say security encryption today is something what should be considered as mandatory. But uh, which versions of SSL or TLS protocols should you support? Which uh, cipher suits? Lately, there were a lot of different uh, issues with some of the versions, some uh, security problems. Uh, when you start from scratch, it's very easy to uh, select only the, the versions which are still considered secure, which are the latest uh, versions, and that's very easy. But over the time, if you are running the API for several years, it gets more and more complicated. So our oldest API, I think it's running over six years now. And some of the clients who were wrote on the beginning by our customers are still running there. And uh, they are actually still working. And uh, every time when you update the TLS configuration and decide that you will not support some older versions, you risk uh, that uh, some of these old clients, which are maybe running on some operating systems which are not really updated uh, since years, might not be able to connect. So it's always a bit of trade-off between the uh, security and between the compatibility with the customers. Depending on your data, the security should probably win at the end. But it's important that you don't uh, stop supporting uh, SSL 3.0 just from scratch from uh, tomorrow, but that you discuss it with your customers and give them some time to test uh, and prepare their applications. Once the TLS channel is uh, established, the AMQP connection can be opened, and uh, uh, the client can do the authentication. AMQP supports uh, SASL, that's a simple authentication and security layer, which gives you many different uh, options. You can start with something as simple as username, password, but you can use Kerberos, or as we do, you can use uh, uh, TLS client authentication, which is done based on the SSL certificates. You should be aware that the more unusual mechanisms you select to use, the higher there is the probability that uh, some of the clients around there will not really support it and will not work with uh, your API. Uh, basically, username and password is supported by every client, but with the other mechanisms, uh, it gets more and more complicated. In Deutsche Börse, we are using the SSL client authentication. That basically means that the identity of the user is taken out from the TLS channel and is established based on the certificate uh, used when opening the connection. So basically, the username is usually constructed based on the uh, subject of the certificate. Well, but that's still not everything. You can use different ways how to authenticate the client. The usual way on the normal internet is to use the public certification authorities. That basically means that uh, you don't say exactly which clients you trust, but you leave this to a certification authority which you trust. That can lead to a lot of different complications, mainly because, uh, as I said, the username is the subject of the certificate. And uh, your view on who the user is is uh, usually not the same view as uh, VeriSign has. So you view your customer maybe under some customer ID or you gave him some username. Uh, for example, we have something what we call member ID, which is a five uh, character code, which identifies every customer. But that's not something what's known to the certification authority. So they will not uh, 
issue a certificate which is based on this uh, identification which we are using. So that's not that great option. On the other end of the spectrum are self-signed certificates, which is actually what we decided to use and what we are still using. The self-signed certificates have the advantage that uh, you tell your customers, generate a self-signed certificate and provide us in a secure way with the public key. And because they are generating the certificate and signing it on their own, if you uh, tell them, use this as the subject in the certificate, they will simply do it and you have in the subject exactly the username which you need. But that still doesn't solve the main problem because it brings together another issues. Uh, one, if you say self-signed certificates, for a lot of people that means unsecure which uh, maybe is not necessarily true, but uh, you want your customers to use your API, so you either have to convince them or we have to do something else. Other problem with the self-signed certificates is uh, that it was one of the things which was not really supported uh, in all the different clients. So during the years, we spent a lot of effort uh, either on our own to implement the support in the different clients or to push companies like Red Hat to implement this uh, in their clients. And uh, last but not least, the problem is not only in the clients, the problem is also uh, in the messaging brokers. Because uh, currently we are still using the uh, merge messaging broker, which is based on Apache Cupid. And uh, that has a great support for using the self-signed certificates. But if you decide to use ActiveMQ, uh, there the support is not that great anymore. I'm not sure you can really do it as easily as with uh, merge messaging. So I wonder, is there some third way which might uh, work better? And uh, to be honest, if I would be starting uh, some new API today, I would probably try uh, to use private certification authority where you run your own certification authority. Uh, your customers don't sign their certificates on their own, but they send them to you so that you can sign them. You still get the advantages of the self-signed certificates uh, that uh, you can define the usernames, but uh, uh, it's not public CAs, so uh, it still doesn't always uh, sound as uh, something that should be trusted, especially if you are dealing with uh, some banks and financial institutions. Uh, another point, maybe in the Internet of Things, using public CA can get probably very expensive if you have separate certificate for every client. So that was the authentication. Uh, authorization, it's something what uh, should be on the API as well. Uh, I won't talk too much detail about authorization. You should use the principle of least privilege, so you should give every user only those rights which it really needs. But I would talk more about uh, different resource limits because that's what's missing in uh, many of the uh, messaging servers and that's what can make your life uh, more complicated or more easier depending on the support. Uh, imagine that you are running some service, uh, you have some customers connecting and some hacker takes down your server and the customers cannot use it anymore. That's uh, a bad situation. But it's even much worse if uh, it's some developer somewhere on the other end of the world who is writing a new application, it's developing it against your production system, then starts half-finished application and uh, goes for lunch. The application is maybe creating more and more temporary queues until your server runs out of memory and dies, and uh, that's something where the limits can help. So if the messaging server supports it, you should definitely set all the different limits for maximum number of connections, maximum number of sessions, maximum number of uh, temporary queues, maximum message size, maximum message rate, everything what's uh, possible uh, should be limited. Now, with all the basic stuff in place, 
the clients can start sending or receiving uh, messages. So the entry points are basically the structure of your queues or topics which you are using uh, to deliver them. We kind of learned uh, several rules which uh, help us make better interfaces if we follow them or maybe the other way around. By not following these rules, we made the bad experiences. The structure of the queues and topics is usually very hard to change once you have hundreds of clients running somewhere and connecting to it. So that's something what you should very carefully think about before you really have the first release of your API and let the customers connect to it. Uh, another thing with which we made a good experience is that uh, every user should have its own uh, namespace in the in the queues and in the topics. So maybe start every queue name with the name of the customer because that helps uh, uh, very much when you are analyzing some problems on, or when your operation teams are running the API. Yeah? By user here, do you mean uh, an actual user, like an end user, or do you mean the, the, the project or the customer? Uh, so, so the question was whether with user, whether it's meant the actual customer end user or the project. So here, uh, uh, I mean definitely the end user, uh, but uh, you can interpret it in your own way who the end user is. So in most of our uh, interfaces, the end user is the company which we are talking with and not really the uh, individual, the person which is uh, using the application which is connected to the API. Uh, together with the namespaces, uh, another very useful rule is that you should definitely not use any, any anonymous uh, objects. So something like uh, tempq123456 uh, doesn't help you when you are operating the system or when you are analyzing some issues in the logs because you have no idea who does this queue belong to, who created it, uh, and so on. And uh, Another useful rule is uh, that you should always uh, create uh, rather more queues than less because in the clients which the customers will write, it's usually much easier to write more receivers to receive from 10 different queues than to receive from single queue only 10% of the messages may be based on some binary payload which is inside the message. Uh, you have to be aware that not every question is, uh, has a yes, no answer. So the APIs don't always work uh, in a simple request response way. That's uh, what looks nice in the simple examples, but very often you need to create some workflows which uh, include uh, multiple different requests and responses, or maybe which include even multiple parties. So one customer requests something, the server acknowledges the request, then asks another customer whether he approves this transaction, and only when this other customer approves the transaction, the transaction is actually completed and entered into the system. And uh, all these workflows need to be properly documented. Yeah? Uh, so the question was whether uh, some metadata can be uh, associated with the queue to identify the user. Uh, I would say that's uh, not really part of the AMQP protocol. Okay. So within the protocol, you of course know which user created the queue, right. but it's not always obvious from the software. And the way how you can do it, that's then a bit uh, specific uh, to the implementation. So the Apache Cupid or Apache ActiveMQ, I think they have something called queue policies, which allow you to uh, the temporary queues uh, be automatically named uh, using some patterns, which uh, then might help in these situations so that the random names are not created like this, but that they follow some uh, schema. Yes. So uh, the second one is uh, create more rather than less queues. I mean, is there some sort of upper limit to the number of queues that you can create or have going simultaneously? Or do you have to worry about that in practice? 
OK, so the question was uh, whether there is some limit uh, how many queues can be created. Uh, I would say, again, that's uh, specific to the implementation which you are using. So on the Apache Cupid, it's definitely no problem to have thousands and thousands of queues. Uh, it, of course, a bit depends uh, how many customers you have or how many connected clients. Let's say that uh, our interfaces have usually hundreds of customers. Uh, if uh, you, for example, implement uh, a smart toothbrush and sell it to millions of people and all these toothbrushes send some messages to you, then you probably cannot afford to open many, many queues. Uh, then, in that case, maybe you can help uh, with something else. Uh, most of the implementation supports some sort of filtering when reading from the queues. But the filtering is easy against some headers or some application properties, but the filtering is very hard against uh, the message payload, which might be some binary data or some complicated XML. So by using some application properties to distinguish the different types of messages, it's much easier to use only single queue, but for the clients to use the filters uh, on the messaging server to get only selected messages. Okay, so I will try to repeat the question. I hope I will get it right. So the question was whether using the namespaces with many different users and with, for example, five character uh, codes, identifying the users, whether it just doesn't create more chaos. Uh, so a uh, lot of the problems are at least in our case, a lot of the problems are not really discovered by uh, uh, our teams who are operating the API. But a lot of the problems are a customer calls the customer support and says, look, this is not working for me. And uh, then when you have really the names in the queues, it's much easier for you to find the queues used by this customer and to see are they full of messages, are the queues empty, is someone connected to the queue. Uh, might be, uh, let's say that in our business, uh, there are not that many potential customers. So maybe that's uh, a bit easier for us. So let's talk for a moment about the message payload. Uh, AMQP has its own type system, or at least uh, each version has kind of its own type system. Uh, which is, great, which is great and supports a lot of stuff, but uh, it's unique for AMQP. So uh, you can use this type system to encode the message bodies, but then uh, you m might not be really free to decide, okay, let's use also MQTT as the alternative protocol, or let's use WebSphere MQ as a alternative for connectivity, because these, uh, you would basically need to transform these uh, payloads into something else, because some MQTT client will not be able to decode the AMQP payloads. Uh, luckily, you can very easily use uh, text or uh, some binary data as a payload in the AMQP messages, so you can choose whether you want to use XML or JSON, or whether you want to use, for example, something like Google Protocol Buffers or Bison. You should be aware that uh, uh, human, readable, human readable formats might be intriguing because it's easier to analyze all the problems, but AMQP itself has no built-in 
compression currently. So if you use something like XML, which is very verbose, then you will get the big messages and you need a lot of bandwidth. So maybe using uh, some binary formats uh, will be better for you. Uh, it's also when you are transferring a lot of numbers, which is what we usually do, uh, decoding these numbers uh, from the text formats into some floats uh, is quite uh, intensive uh, on the resources, uh, on the hardware resources. That's, uh, again, a lot easier if you have binary encodings. And uh, there's a lot more than uh, just these things. Uh, we talked a bit about it on the beginning. Uh, how does it work when the libraries are not good enough? Uh, the first problem which you will run into is that the documentation of the different open source libraries uh, is not good enough. There are usually many different code examples, but they are simply too primitive. So if they contain some authentication, it's always username password based authentication. They are often just showing how to send one message, but they don't show you how uh, send or receive thousand messages in very fast pace. Uh, also, they usually contain just some hello world content and not the real binary data which you want to send uh, over the protocol. So uh, at the end, you will always need to create some programming documentation and uh, prepare some code examples so that your customers know how to use the different clients. And uh, over the time, you will definitely see uh, many negative use cases of things which some of your customers did and which didn't work really well. And uh, that's another thing which is very useful for documentation purposes. Uh, unfortunately, I'm saying here that the open source projects usually lack proper documentation and examples. And I have to say, we wrote our own documentation and examples, but uh, didn't really manage to commit it back to the projects, which uh, is uh, unfortunate, and I should definitely fight, find some time for it. Another problem which you may run into is the compatibility. So on paper, it's everything perfect. You have a client uh, from vendor A, which supports MQP 1.0. You have a server from vendor B, which supports MQP 1.0. And uh, the standard is ISO standard, so what can go wrong? I was actually positively surprised that we really have uh, uh, clients which were not updated uh, for the last six years which are still able to connect against the latest versions of the messaging broker. I, on the beginning, expected that the compatibility would be much worse, but it's still great if you can find some time to test all the different clients, make sure that they work somehow, at least with some basic tests against your APIs, that they can authenticate, that they pass the authorization, and then you can create some uh, compatibility lists so that your clients know uh, what's uh, compatible and what's not. Yeah? Um, do you still have to support AMQP uh, 0 0.10 with, hmm? in a mixed environment with AMQP 1.0? So the question was whether we still have to support uh, AMQP 0 0.10. And the answer is yes. Uh, we are still running uh, most of our installations on the merge messaging software which supports both uh, 0 0.10 and 1.0. And we are basically now in the process of uh, uh, getting the customers to the AMQP 1.0 so that eventually, once everyone is there, we can kind of cut off the support for the old protocol and maybe to move to some uh, uh, newer applications. So, so it is like a rolling upgrade path. You can upgrade. That's, uh, you that's one of the advantages of the merge messaging or Apache Cupid project, that uh, uh, it provides you a clear migration path uh, to the 1.0 protocol. You don't have to say, okay, tomorrow I will stop supporting AMQP 10 and uh, start supporting only AMQP 1.0. Yeah. Okay, so the question was uh, whether we have uh, separate versions uh, 
of the 1.0 or 0.10 APIs, or uh, whether we have some abstraction layer to make uh, basically the same thing work with both at the same time. Yes, so in the Apache Cupid or Merge Messaging Broker, uh, there are simply some queues or an AMQP exchanges which are coming from the 0.10 world. And uh, once you enable the 1.0 protocol, you can uh, have access to the same queues. So we didn't really change the queues or the exchanges and the topics at all. Uh, we basically just let the users access them over the new protocol. So. Uh, at the end, it's just one API for us. So the broker does all the magic for you, basically? Uh, yes, the broker does all the magic. It translates the messages from 1.0 to 0.10 uh, and uh, vice versa. Uh, another thing which is useful for the compatibility is uh, to test the upcoming releases. Uh, it's always easier if you manage to find out that the new release of the uh, Cupid Proton client doesn't work with your interface and uh, maybe get it fixed before the release because once it's released, then uh, you will get into the problem that your customers download the latest version, start developing some application, then they found out uh, that it's not running. And... Uh, that can be avoided if you test the upcoming releases uh, when they are in beta or release candidates. Question? Do you have any uh, setup with your customers where they participate in the testing? Yes. So the question was whether we have some setup where the customers can participate uh, in the testing. We have uh, something what we call simulation environment, which uh, is uh, basically identical to our production environment. It's uh, operated uh, by the same team. And uh, that's what the customers or their vendors who are developing the applications for them can use uh, as, a, uh, as a sandbox for testing. So when we do some upgrade, we always do it in the simulation environment, and only a few weeks later we do it in the production to give everyone time to uh, adjust. Uh, for the end, maybe as an inspiration, uh, one of the interfaces which we have is called Durex Clearing FixML interface, and it connects uh, one of our subsidiaries, uh, Urex Clearing, with its customers. So the clients on the other end connecting to us are all the different major banks, funds, who uh, are using our exchanges. Uh, as I said, the, it supports the 0, 10, and 1.0 protocols. Additionally to that, uh, we have as a connection alternative uh, IBM WebSphere MQ because uh, when we started with it, some of our customers who have a lot of uh, WebSphere MQ installations insisted that we have to use uh, WebSphere MQ. On the beginning, it was a lot of them, but during the time, most of them found out that the AMQP is very easy to use and that uh, it's not as uh, unreliable, unstable as they were afraid on the beginning. And uh, I think we have uh, only single digit number of customers who are actually using the WebSphere MQ connectivity. And all the documentation to this interface is, uh, is public, so uh, if you want, you can have a look at it. There are some programming guides uh, with the code examples in different languages and so on. And that's it. So if you have any further questions, yeah? You mentioned earlier that uh, you can connect to a more general queue and then apply filtering. And I was wondering whether the actual filtering workflow is taking place on the server or on the client side. Uh, in the, the AMQP010, uh, so, uh, just to repeat the question, the question was whether the filtering of the messages is done on the server side or on the client side. Uh, on the 0 0.10 protocol, there was no support for filtering on the server. So uh, usually, if there was some filtering, then it was on the client side. That's much better on the 1.0 version, where the filtering is, support is kind of built into the protocol. So I think all of the 1.0 implementations, uh, uh, when creating a receiver from the queue, you can basically specify your filter. 
and uh, then the broker automatically gives you only the messages matching the filter. Uh, it then depends a bit on the product, which uh, exact uh, filters are supported or not. It's usually quite easy if you want to filter based on some application headers, but uh, it gets much more complicated if you want to filter based on some binary payload or even XML payload. That's all time we had for this presentation. Thank you, Jakub. So if anyone has any further... <laughs> if anyone has any further questions, I will be around so you can ask. And those who ask the questions, they can pick up the scarves here. <laughs>